Years ago, there was a senator from Wisconsin named William Proxmire. He used to come to the floor every month and give what he called his Golden Fleece Award for the worst example of federal government waste. Earlier this year, I launched a new series dedicated to that tradition, floor speeches that build off the Proxmire work with a focus on the most extreme cases of the pharmaceutical industry's greed. It's known as the Pharma Fleece Award. I've highlighted price gouging for life-saving insulin, the patent abuses that extend monopoly control over pricing of drugs, and the billions of dollars worth of medications that are thrown away each year deliberately due to the production of oversized, unnecessary drug vials. But this month, I want to focus on the pharmaceutical industry's role in another national disgrace, the opioid epidemic. We are in the midst of the nation's worst drug overdose epidemic in our history. There is no town too small, no suburb too wealthy to be spared the suffering and the death that have been wrought by this problem. Last year, 2,062 people in my home state of Illinois died from opioid overdosing. There was culpability with nearly all the stakeholders, including the United States government, and there's no denying how this epidemic was ignited. For years, the pharmaceutical industry wildly mischaracterized the risk of opioids, falsely claiming they were less addictive and less harmful, that these painkillers should be prescribed for common aches and pains, even when the industry itself had information proving the dangers of such long-term use. In 2007, the manufacturer of OxyContin, Purdue Pharma, pleaded guilty to a felony charge of misbranding the drug by misrepresenting OxyContin's risks. This resulted in a modest fine as the company continued to flood the nation with their deadly painkillers. New reporting this morning from the Washington Post found that Big Pharma saturated the country with, listen to this, 76 billion oxycodone and hydrocodone pills between 2006 and 2012. During a six-year period, 76 billion pills produced by pharma. One subsidiary company of Mallinckrodt put 28 billion opioid pills on the market during this time, this six-year period of time, 28 billion. Downstate in Illinois, a small rural county, Hardin County, has fewer than 10 doctors who can prescribe controlled substances. Total population of the county, 4,300 people. It's one of the smallest, least populated country, counties in my state. In the year 2010, approximately 6 million hydrocodone pills and 1 million oxycodone pills were shipped to Hardin County and its surrounding communities. 4,300 people, 7 million pills, all of this data was actually captured and reported to a federal agency, the Drug Enforcement Administration. They'll come up again in my presentation. That means that drug manufacturers knew about this obscene volume of pills being produced and sold. The drug distributors knew exactly where and how this was being transported, and law enforcement had its eyes on it all along. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the list of the top opioid distributors and top opioid manufacturers to every corner of this country from 2006 to 2012. Without objection. Thank you. This opioid epidemic wasn't started by some runaway virus. There were decisions made by real people to flood America's towns and streets with a blizzard of prescriptions as Richard Sackler of Purdue Pharma put it in his own words. In fact, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States produced 14 billion opioid pills in 2016 alone. Enough pills, opioid pills, for every adult in America to have a three-week supply of opioids. Who would approve the production of 14 billion opioid pills in one year, 2016. 
Turned out, it was your government. The Drug Enforcement Administration of the United States of America that's responsible for determining and basically giving a license for the production of a specific amount of opioid pills allowed to be distributed to the market each year. It's the Drug Enforcement Administration of all agencies that establishes annual production quotas for opioids that are effectively the gatekeepers for pharma. Pharma, of course, wants to produce as much as possible, to sell as much as possible. But the Drug Enforcement Administration is supposed to draw the line. For all of these years, while we face this epi epidemic, our government, the Drug Enforcement Administration, was increasing the production quotas each year for opioid pills. Between 1993 and 2015, the Drug Enforcement Administration allowed the production of oxycodone to increase in America 39 times, from 3.5 tons of opioids in 1993 to 151 tons of opioids in 2015. It's the same story for hydrocodone, which increased 12-fold, and fentanyl, which increased 25-fold. I pressed the Drug Enforcement Administration on this issue, asking them how they could possibly approve these ever-increasing quotas while America faced this epidemic. How did they reconcile their decision to flood America with these drugs at a time when they were being abused and addiction was leading to death all across our country? Last year, I passed bipartisan legislation. Senator John Kennedy, Republican from Louisiana and I, gave the Drug Enforcement Administration more authority to set common sense production levels. It was hard to believe we had to do that, to actually bring it to their attention that they were authorizing the production of opioid pills into an America that was facing the worst opioid epidemic in its history. Previously, the Drug Enforcement Administration could only look at what Pharma asked for when determining quotas. In other words, they believed that they had officially statutory blinders where they couldn't even consider the impact of Pharma's annual request for production. So Senator Kennedy and I, on a bipartisan basis, changed the law to require the Drug Enforcement Administration to consider abuse, overdose deaths, and the public health impact. Now, between 2016 and 2019, finally, the Drug Enforcement Administration has lowered opioid quotas by an average of 46%. No longer can Big Pharma get away with producing the sheer volume of painkillers. The Drug Enforcement Administration will soon be proposing its 2020 quotas, and I'll be soon sending them a letter urging them to use their new authority, which we put in this new law that I passed with Senator Kennedy, to continue reigning in Big Pharma's insatiable demand. Think about that. While we're going through this opioid epidemic, Pharma, the people who make the pills, are coming to Washington to the Drug Enforcement Administration and getting permission each year to produce billions of opioid pills to be sold in the United States, enough for every adult American to have a three-week opioid prescription. The Center for Disease Control sent out a notice to doctors nationwide, incidentally, two years ago, and said, only in the most extraordinary cases should you prescribe for more than three days. Only in the most extraordinary cases. And then watch them carefully, because in a short period of time, addiction begins. Three days? Pharma was asking for production of opioid pills so that each adult America could buy three weeks' worth of pills and the Drug Enforcement Administration was complicit. To hold all stakeholders accountable, major legal challenges have been brought against the pharmaceutical industry for their role in deceptive promotion and all of the suffering and deaths that have resulted. Over 1,600 lawsuits from states, counties, cities, and victims have been consolidated into one federal case in Cleveland, Ohio. This reminds me of another public health scourge we confronted when Americans suffer the consequences of misleading marketing and false information about the health risk of tobacco. 
It took the 1998 Master Tobacco Settlement Agreement to finally hold major manufacturers of tobacco responsible for their action, an action these cigarettes uh, that the hooked youth and adults to a lifetime of addiction and death. That settlement was estimated to provide states with $246 billion over 25 years ago. But uh, sadly, only a tiny fraction of that amount, only 8% of the settlement was actually dedicated to tobacco prevention and cessation. Instead, $145 billion from the tobacco settlement has gone to fill state budgets and pet projects, roads, bridges, stadiums, even a tobacco museum. Should today's opioid litigation result in large monetary settlements from the pharmaceutical companies and their distributors, it is essential that this funding be dedicated to legitimate public health efforts to respond to the current epidemic and prevent the next one. Mr. President, in the city of Chicago, near an area known as Greektown, there's a drug rehab facility that I've visited many times. It's called Haymarket. It was started by a Catholic priest many years ago who took on a ministry which nobody else wanted. He was the one who prowled every night along Skid Row and helped those who were addicted to drugs and alcohol turn their lives around. He started this Haymarket house as a refuge for them in an attempt to give them some help toward uh, escaping their addiction and being rehabbed. Can you imagine what it's like today? He's gone, sadly. He's gone today, but they continue the Haymarket House. Imagine what they face trying to deal with a combination of addiction to drugs and alcohol and mental illness on top of it. They are dramatically understaffed. They don't have the necessary bed space for people who need a helping hand, folks who realize they need a helping hand. Wouldn't it be best if some of the resources, should there be a successful outcome of this Cleveland lawsuit, be dedicated to places just like that all over the United States? And I can tell you, in the city of Chicago, there are many more options than there are in the more sparsely populated downstate areas that I hail from. There are some counties where people wait six months once they've realized their need for help, wait six months for any kind of treatment whatsoever, and then have to travel great distances for that to happen. Senator Sherrod Brown and I recently wrote an opinion piece that was published in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and I might just uh, confess publicly in the hopes that those who were party to this lawsuit in Cleveland would read it, where the consolidated, consolidated court case is taking place. And we outlined what we think should happen if we have any input to a settlement. We need to make sure that money is spent for addiction treatment, medication, residential and community retreatment services, mental health counseling, which is a necessary adjunct to this effort. Building our behavioral health workforce, naloxone distribution, and addressing childhood trauma that is often the root of addiction. Wouldn't it be great if there is a settlement here that it is dedicated to ending this drug epidemic and turning lives around and saving people from addiction and death. The diversion of tobacco settlement money should be a cautionary tale that guides our efforts to heal from the opioid epidemic. If Big Pharma is held to account for fueling this crisis, their restitution should be devoted to making our, helping our nation heal. Mr. President, this chart shows the dramatic increase in the production of two of the most popular products, opioid products, I'll never be able to explain how the agency of the United States federal government dedicated to protecting us from drug crime and drug addiction ended up authorizing these enormous quotas of the production of opioid pills. But we know what happened. In tiny Hardin County in southern Illinois, as well as the streets of Chicago, they were flooded with opioid pills. And when the opioid pills became too expensive, they turned to a cheaper alternative, heroin. And then heroin was being laced with fentanyl, and today we have this deadly epidemic almost out of control. I can't understand what Pharma was thinking, except just looking at the profits and bottom line that would justify the production of that level of opioid pills into the United States of America. All I can promise is that a number of us, myself included, will be holding the Drug Enforcement Administration accountable to make certain that this is not duplicated again in the years to come. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the evidence of quorum.